stop a little bit early. Our guest speaker this afternoon is Dr. Ellen Ferraro. She is currently the director of the Systems Architecture Design and Integration Directorate, which is called SATED, for Raytheon Company. In this role, she leads an organization of over 1,100 people responsible for supporting all aspects of systems engineering, including requirements, definition, modeling, and simulation efforts, system effectiveness, and operational analysis and algorithm development. She received her PhD in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst in 1994 under a NASA graduate student research fellowship after which she joined Raytheon. She's a member of the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, is an active member of the Boston section of the Society of Women Engineers, also called SWE, and is the recipient of the SWE 1999 Distinction uh, distinguished New Engineer Award, the Mass High Tech uh, Women uh, to Watch in 2006 Award, and the SWE 2007 Emerging Leaders Award. Please welcome to the NCGS STEM Symposium, Dr. Ellen Ferraro. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, so a little energy here. So I'm really excited to be here this afternoon to talk to, about, to all of you. Um, I got really excited as I looked at, as I, I got this invitation to come talk and I looked at your website and realized that this is a coalition of it's close to something like 150 uh, schools nationwide and even some of them international. Um, and the re reason that I got really excited about that is I realized as a group how many young girls that you touch, so, you know, just looking at you as a group right here, how many young girls you touch. And that really excited me because I spent the last 15 years focused on reaching out to young girls and young women uh, to encourage them to go into STEM. And then to know that you have a whole symposium focused on advancing girls in STEM. That was like my dream, right, to get to talk to you. So, so I'm really excited to be here. I have two goals this afternoon. One is to keep you all awake, because <laughs> I know you've had an action-packed, very engaging day, and I know sometimes it's hard late in the afternoon. Uh, so that's my first goal. My second goal is to give you my perspective as a female engineer in industry, OK? Um, as the intro said, so I have uh, over a thousand engineers working for me. I've been practicing for over 15 years. And uh, I, I want to share with you some of the things I've learned over those years. Okay? I'm going to start out with a little bit of my background. So um, I grew up in a city called Fitchburg, Massachusetts. It's about an hour west of here. Okay? And it is a mill town. It's a paper mill town. Boomed in the Industrial Revolution and coming forward. And uh, there's a river that runs through. It's called the National River that obviously the paper mill is built, built up along that river. And every day I went to school in the morning, the bus drove along the river. And I thought it was perfectly normal for the river to change color every day. I thought all rivers did that. Um, here's a picture of the National River. They were making red paper that day. OK, this is in the night. The picture was taken in the 1970s, National Geographic. OK, and I, as I rode to school every morning, I thought, wouldn't it be great if the river were clean? If I could see that river the way it looked 100 plus years ago. Clean, fish, right? Maybe you could even go in the water. But I also said it would also be great if we could still make paper, because by the way, my father works for the paper mill. And don't, all of my friends' fathers work for the paper mill, because in a city like that, everyone worked for that central industry, right? So this is the river today. People canoe on it, fish in it. The National River is a beautiful river. Now, I'm not taking credit for it, the Clean Water <laughs> Act. I'd love to, but the Clean Water Act really drove that. But, but it goes to show you how a girl was thinking then, and I think girls think today, was how could you make a difference in the world? How could you make things better? OK, that was naturally occurring. Now, what I didn't think about is how you can use technology to make things better. And I think that's one of the big connections we need to make with girls. Mm -hmm. Right? They want, naturally want to make things better. They want to make a difference in the world. But how can we use technology to do that? Because right? that's the key. So uh, I am the youngest. I grew up the youngest of six kids. Uh, I have my own definition of what hand-me-downs is. Um, <laughs> but I was very fortunate 
because I had a father who was an engineer, two brothers who were engineers, and a sister who, who was an engineer. So by the time I was getting ready to go to, to think about what I would major in in college, I had already been introduced to engineering. And I realized that all girls do not have that. Okay. So for me, it was just, okay, what kind of engineering is it going to be? And I chose electrical. So I went on and I got my undergraduate degree. And towards the end of, as I was closing in, um, towards the end of junior year and going to senior year, it was a mentor that asked me, well, where are you going to graduate school? And I never even thought of going to graduate school at that point in time. Okay, I was going to graduate. I was going to go, go out and work in industry. I never even thought of going to graduate school. So that mentor played a key role in my consideration of going to graduate school. And it wasn't just graduate school, but where are you going to get your PhD? Okay, so pivotal moment there for me. So I did go to graduate school, and I studied um, what's called microwave remote sensing. So it's using uh, instrumentation to study the Earth, microwave remote sen sensing of the Earth. And I got to go to Greenland, okay? So I spent uh, about four years of doing research, make, taking very accurate measurements of global ice sheets, in particular in Greenland. And that ties to global climate change, okay, or what we think of as global warming. So the understanding how our ice sheets change. So I had this great opportunity to go with NASA scientists to the, to the uh, Greenland ice sheet uh, to do these measurements. It was, it was an awesome opportunity. I will tell you that orange thing that's behind me there, they told me that was an Arctic oven. I now realize they were just trying to convince me that it was warmer than just sleeping in a tent on the ice sheet, but it was really just sleeping in a tent on the ice sheet. <laughs> and I'm um, wearing some fancy Arctic gear there. Um, but I have to tell you that I never thought as an engineer, an electrical engineer in particular, that I would be doing work in Greenland, okay? Kind of pictured working at a lab bench maybe doing circuits, but not going to Greenland. When I graduated with my PhD, I went straight to, to come to Raytheon. And uh, I had one condition in coming to Raytheon. I said, I'll do anything for you, but please don't send me to any place it's cold. <laughs> and so they sent me to Australia. <laughs> The picture in, in, in the upper right-hand corner is, is one of our radar systems. It's an over-the-horizon radar. And what, it, what we use it for is to uh, detect illegal entry into the United States, in particular of drug traffickers. So it's a count called the counter-drug system. And I worked several years on that system. We have, we have multiple ones in, in the United States. And the Australians have a similar situation to us in that they have a lot of uh, boundaries to protect in particular, Australia has the northern boundary, okay, where they have a legal entry. So we had a uh, technical exchange, and I spent uh, quite a bit of time down in Australia sharing technical information, and they were sharing with us. Um, and their radar happens to be in the outback, so it never gets below 90 degrees there. The picture in the lower right is Ayers Rock, if you recognize it, which is in central Australia. So again, never thought that uh, being an electrical engineer would bring me to yet another corner of the earth. A little more uh, about my background. Uh, I married an electrical engineer and ironically we're peers on the org chart so he has about a thousand engineers working for him in our engineering organization as well. It makes for some very interesting dinner conversations. <laughs> We have two daughters. Samantha is 13 and Alexis is 11. So those of you who have had teenage daughters, please think of me over the next few years. <laughs> uh, the dogs are pet, the giraffes are not. So, so that's my background. Um, I want to share with you uh, a bit of the industry, industry perspective on this. So it's a little dramatic on the burning platform, but I know all of you know the current state and uh, how, how, how dire it is. We, we have a tremendous uh, demand for educated STEM professionals, right? The demand has increased tremendously over the last few decades, in fact, more than doubled, uh, while the supply has dwindled, okay? So 50, females make up over 50% of, uh, of our current population, yet only about 20% are coming out, uh, females are coming out with engineering or STEM type of, of background uh, degrees. So we are just, the supply is getting bigger, the demand is getting smaller. So from an industry perspective, we are in an economic crisis because we cannot hire the amount of STEM professionals that we need. And in particular, 
Our, our uh, company like us, we are a defense contractor, so we cannot hire uh, foreign nationals. We have to hire U.S. citizens. And so we cannot go outside the United States to fill that supply. We need to grow them internal to the United States. So it's really a, it, it is a critical situation for this, and I, and I know you know that. Um, and if you haven't seen this, this is specifically focusing on the engineering piece of, of STEM, because that, that's been my focus. This is looking back uh, to 1995, how many earned engineering degrees percentage-wise we have for females and other underrepresented groups. So the top curve being females and the ones below it representing other, the other groups, underrepresented groups. And I have to tell you, back, so I finished graduate school in 94, and I have to tell you that you know, I knew that females were a small percentage of the population uh, in engineering, but I envisioned that 10, 20 years from then, that we would be 50%. I really thought that's where we were going. I thought we were on the uptrend because I was seeing things start to increase. Okay, so that's the world that I envisioned where we are today, but you'll see that it kind of peaked out and that we're actually trending down. And we're focusing on it right now when we're trending down. Can you imagine if we weren't? What might happen? Right, so it's very, very important that we all focus on this. And we want to turn that curve up. So uh, I, I've done some research, and I know you've heard some of this, these themes today, so I'm just going to touch on it very briefly. Um, this was, in particular, a WGBH uh, study that was done, but there's lots of studies done on the messaging, right? What are we sending out for a message? Okay, so this starts with what do girls want to hear, and in particular this, this is focused on high school girls, but I think it, would, it, would, it holds for middle school girls as well. What do they want to hear when you talk to them about potential careers? They want to hear, I want to like what I'm doing, I want to enjoy it, right? You want to go to, you want to, go to work and, and have fun. They want a, a good working environment, so they want to like to go there. They want to make a difference, and that's the key one I've really focused on. They want to make a difference. Remember how I went back to what was I thinking about as a young girl? They want a good e income. It doesn't have to be the best, but it needs to be a good one. And they want that flexibility, right? They want to be able to have work-life balance. They want to be able to manage things. They want flexibility. But oftentimes when we talk to them about, in particular, engineering, because it's very discipline-based when you talk about engineering. You're either a mechanical engineer, you're an electrical engineer, you're a civil engineer. It's very discipline-based. We talk about it being a challenge. And I swear that's because we're so proud of ourselves for making it through. We're patting ourselves on the back going, it's really hard. You know, it's a good challenge for you. Go take on the challenge. We say it's difficult, but it's rewarding. Um, and we talk about math and science, but in a way that we're saying, you know, it's, you have to love math and science to solve all these problems. And then finally, we go through, like I just said, this, this litany of what do industrial engineers do? What do manufacturing engineers do, right? Rather than focusing on what they want to hear. But the fact of the matter is, it's, it, it is everything they want to hear. We're just not messaging it right. OK? So here's what I, when I go out and I talk to girls, and I try to do this as much as possible, here's what I start with. Let me tell you all the things engineering is not. Let's start with that, OK?